What is up, my fellow Chibits? As per usual, I'm here to bring all of you the weekly manga chapter review of Tokyo Ghoul Re Chapter 45. And as always, I would like to say I'm very sorry for this, you know, being hours late because it takes a while for me to research. And also, I'm not even into the rendering process. I could probably take maybe a couple hours. So forgive me for this review most likely being very late, maybe a day late, but you know how it is. So, I quickly want to say real quick, before I get into diving into the panel work and different things like that, this chapter, I'm just going to say, what I'm going to be covering is biblical symbolism, going to be covering flower symbolism, and some fucked up torture that just add to what the fuck. And then, this imaginary disease that's like common in Japan. So there, there's quite a few things I want to discuss. And I just want to say, get ready for a ride. I don't know if this review is going to probably go over an hour. I think it might be maybe 30 to 40 minutes, probably. That, that's what I want to try to get this video at, because I don't really have that much time today to really just go for hours on end. But I still want to cover everything. I don't want to skip everything, but I don't think there will be a very, very long video today. So anyways, first things I want to get into is the color page, actually. The color page... I need to discuss because this actually leads into some of the themes of this chapter. Yeah, the color page does. Usually when it comes to Ishida, he makes color pages or illustrations on his Twitter account or, you know, his color pages, and he hints at certain things that might happen in the future. He does this a lot. With, for instance, with Toka with the apple, and then Eto with the apple, and then also recently he did a picture of Rize. Yeah, he drew a picture of Rize, and so that's probably implying that is going to be coming very soon. And then also you have other things like, you know, when he drew, you know, the battle suit, Sasaki or, you know, Kaneki, and then also drew the little kid or the little Kaneki, white-haired Kaneki inside of Sasaki's mind. Ashida has a history of hinting at the future or kind of hinting at the chapter's themes through his color pages. And so that's why I want to actually dive into this color page right off the bat. So the color page, page one, it shows uh, Kanye, he, his head's back, like his head is back, so it shows you like, you know, he just has his head looking up at the sky. And the colors of it is really cool and vibrant. But one thing I want to point out is what is coming out of Kanye's mouth. If you look closely, you see rose petals just flowing out of his mouth. And when I first saw this, like, I didn't think much of it. Like, I, I didn't think much of this color page when I first saw it because I knew it was going to mean something. But I just waited until I read the chapter and then I looked back at just to see. And then I started thinking of different things, what this entire page means and then a fellow Chibits actually on Facebook linked me something that there's more meaning behind this color page than meets the eye. Now I thought that the petals coming out of Kanye's mouth was purity and I still believe it actually means that but there is another meaning which I will get into in just a moment. So obviously Ashita's been getting into some biblical symbolism these past couple chapters with the apple, Eto being God and you know giving an apple kind of being represented as the devil Many things like that, and I started thinking of this, you know, flower situation with coming out of Kanye's mouth as a biblical type sense, where flowers usually represent purity, purity of the soul, or, you know, just purity in general, and that's kind of what flowers mean in a biblical sense. And thinking about it like that, when I saw Kanye just upchucking, like he's vomiting out flowers, I'm like, it's like different ways you could take this. You could have it to where he's puking up his purity. Kanye is literally puking up his purity to where he is changing inside mentally to where he might no longer view Shu as his master or a person he even cares about. Then, after I thought about that, Achievement linked me something, or gave me a name, so to say, about what else this cover page, this color page actually means. And the name I was given was... Hana Haki Byo. I think that's how you say it. I I'll spell it out. It's H-A-N-A... H-A-K-I, and then B-Y-O-U, ha Hana Haki Byo, and this is actually an imaginary disease that is common in Japan, like it's known in folklore and stuff, and I've heard about this disease actually somewhere in anime and manga, I've actually heard about this somewhere, I don't know exactly where I heard it before, but I have heard something about this a long time ago, but it flew over my head because I haven't seen much of it, and I want to thank the Chibit actually that pointed this out to me because I just thought it was about purity and stuff, but it also has more meaning behind that, and the meaning behind the vomiting of flowers is this imaginary disease. 
A disease of a human system that coughed up flowers due to severe one-sided love. Its infection route is through contact with vomited flowers. In order to fully recover the disease, the one's love must be fulfilled. For instance, in a sense, your love has to be equally exchanged. Like, here's another example of what this means, okay? Another quote of what this Hanahaki disease is. Now, Hanahaki disease is an illness born from one-sided love. Okay, so one-sided love, for instance, Kanye loves Shu, and he thinks, you know, Shu doesn't love him, one-sided love. That's kind of what Eto's been implying. So, this illness is born from one-sided love, where the patient throws up and coughs up flower petals when they suffer from one-sided love. The infection can be removed through surgery. Now, I just want to quickly emphasize, this is an imaginary disease. This isn't a real disease. Of course, people are not going to be up-chucking fucking flowers, but... The point is, this is a reference to folklore, and Nishida does do this from time to time. So the infection can be removed through surgery, but the feelings disappear along with the petals. So what this means is, or implies, is that if, let's say, Kanye took the surgery, that would mean that his feelings for Shu or the Sukiyama family would disappear entirely. So that's what this disease implies. So if he takes, you know, the surgery, or in sense, taking what Eto is doing in this chapter, replanting him then he will lose all love for the Tsukiyama family. Now, it can be cured without side effects, only when the feelings are returned. So the only way Kanye to overcome this disease without side effects to where he will lose love in Shu and the Tsukiyama family is by Shu coming to him and saying, I love you, or, you know, I care about you, you're important to me, different things like that. And since Shu is not there, he's currently unconscious at the end of the chapter, that's not going to happen. So where this is going right now is Kanye is going to give up his love for the Tsukiyama family, and he's probably going to hate Shu, he's going to hate the Tsukiyama family, and he's probably going to come attack Sasaki Heisei and the Quinkex children, later on because of what Eto is doing to him through the replanting process. Now, I want to point out something else, too. The chapter title, like, the, t uh, the title of this chapter is called Replants in English, from what I looked up. And so, for this chapter to be called Replant, it suits the theme of the chapter. For instance, right now, Kanye is puking up flowers. For instance, puking up his purity, in a biblical sense. And in another way to look at it, Kanye is got this imaginary disease where he is having one-sided love. He's being affected, and Eto is replanting him. Now, there's other means to take this replanting, which I will get into when I get to that part of the chapter, but that is pretty much the meaning behind the color page. A Hana hockey disease and puking up purity. Now that I got that away, let's move on with this chapter review. So, tell me your thoughts on that. Like, do you agree with my uh, thoughts on that? And also, I want to thank the Chibit once again that gave me the Hanahaki reference. I That flew over my head. I just thought it was purity, and then someone gave, gave me that, and I'm like, oh, shit. So, once again, thank you. So, moving on to the, um, let's see, that's the game showcase. Actually, I want to talk a bit real quick about this. Uh, recently, there's been a Tokyo Ghoul game, I've noticed, and I think everybody knows by now that there's a game coming out, and there's even a game, you know, showing Kijima, well, I noticed that the game looks pretty cool. You know, one of these days I want to try this actually Tokyo Ghoul game. I'd like to play it. Okay, so I'm getting a little bit off topic. Let's get back on to, you know, the chapter. So the first page actually gives us, you know, the panel work and stuff besides the color page. We get to see German singing. Now, I've heard mixed things about this, okay? I've heard some Shibits tell me that the translation from this German song to English is correct, and I've heard others say that this translation is incorrect. So, if any of you German Shibits can translate this, is the translation of what this means proper or not? So, I want to say it in English. Cascade, rain, cascade down. Wake for me those dreams again that I dream in childhood when water foamed on the sand. When oppressive summer heat contended idly with cool freshness, and shiny leaves stripped with dew, and crops turned a darker blue. Cascade rain, cascade down. So, I'm just gonna ask, you Chibits, is that translation correct or not? If you can, please let me know. Like, if it's correct or if it's incorrect. And if it is incorrect, please give me the proper translation. I'd like to know, because, you know, stuff like this really means a lot when it comes to the symbolism of Tokyo Ghoul and finding out more meaning. But let's talk about this page for a quick second, okay? There's many ways to take this page. For one thing, you have it to where there's German and then it's being translated into English. So, you have German singing going on right now. So, let's just take it as German language is being spoken and sung at this moment. 
The ways you could take this first page is Kanye is in his mind, his happy place, so to say, and he's remembering his master Shu, and he's singing a song from his memory. Maybe Shu is singing this song in his memory, maybe Kanye is remembering this voice in his head from Shu, maybe something like that's going on because he's in his happy place. Or, or Eto is singing this song to Kanye. It might be a possibility that Eto is straight up singing this song to Kanye while he's being tortured. Because we do know Eto is intelligent. She's a book writer, and she said, you know, you need good imagination and stuff like that. So she's intelligent. And I'm willing to bet since Eto, you know, reads books and stuff, she probably knows a little bit of German, a lot of German. And she's probably singing in German to Kanye right now just to give him... Like, fucked up torture. I mean, that's kind of some fucked up torture, too, because what's going on with it? Which, I'll get into the torture things with Kanye later on. But, I believe that Eto is singing German to Kanye on this page. Or, Kanye's in his happy place, remembering Shu singing to him. One or the other. So, take it how you leave it. Let me know your thoughts. What do you believe is going on the first page? Do you believe Eto is singing to him? Or do you believe that's just, you know, sh you know Kanye in his happy place? Let me know. Okay, so we move over to the Sukiyama group. Like, for instance, you know, we're finding out more about Sukiyama's family and what type of role they have to play in society. And you remember what I said in my last review about V and how they control politics and they don't want humanity to break out of the cage, they burn all the bridges? You remember what I said at the end and the beginning of the reviews, in my past two chapter reviews? Well, it seems like I'm kind of correct with that because... The Sukiyama group, from this page right here, from what we found out, is the Sukiyama family, like, controls a shit ton of things. Like, here, let me see. Their business covers food, precious metals, iron and steel, chemistry, and much more. They're in many sectors. So what this implies is that the Sukiyama family has dabbled in almost everything when it comes to business wise and they control a shit ton of the human world ghouls the ghouls control a shit ton of the regular human world that means ghouls and politics go hand to hand v think about it so the entire discussion i had about v with how they're manipulating politics ccg ccg's gaining power and stuff like this more and more apparent now after this chapter but what's scary is is the actually the actual impact from what happens if the Sukiyama family is taken down for instance if the family is taken down you got to go figure like if you have this head honcho family the Sukiyama family that controls so much business metal steel you know let's say just different chemistry just so much shit in the world like let's say it's like Microsoft Sony and let's say just all sorts of these big organizations like Google and stuff all coming together and being owned by Sukiyama and Sukiyama's family is taken down as ghouls. What do you think happens to those, you know, underneath that, you know, the Sukiyama family controls? Obviously, there's going to be a lot of turmoil on the stock market. You know, there's going to be to where people are going to have outrage. People are going to lose their jobs. Many things are going to happen. So with the Sukiyama family being targeted like it is being done at this moment... That is going to hurt a lot of people. Not just ghouls, but humanity in general is going to be hurt. It's probably going to be an economic crisis if the Tsukiyama family is targeted and attacked. And at the end of the chapter, they are being attacked. So, this is going to have a lot of negative repercussions to the entire public if this breaks out. And what is implied here, what Kijima says and all of them when they're having their conversation, is that CCG knew of the Tsukiyama family most likely being a ghoul group. Yeah, it, it is implied with this conversation that CCG might have known that Sukiyama's group, the Sukiyama family, was ghouls, but controlling everything. But they just let it slide because if they were to attack said ghouls and remove them, there might be more impact to overall society than just letting them be. So you get my point there. CCG is willingly letting some ghouls that control higher up status of positions in the world free. Let them do whatever they want, because they're probably in the pocket of V or paying off V. So corruption with the government and politics are starting to show. It's starting to come full circle now. We're starting to understand what's really going on and how CCG really operates. Letting 
school groups like the Tsukiyama family go just because they control so much. I'm being paid off. Okay, so now that I got that out of the way, and I've got this, you know, just handled, you have to work Kijima and them. They, they realize that most likely since this was done and most likely CCG knows about it, they're probably going to be hushed up. Like, there's going to be information that's probably shoved and brushed under the rug, which goes back to what I said in my last chapter review. You notice how CCG has a pattern. They love brushing everything under the rug when it comes to Heisei Sasuke, the eye patch ghoul, Amon, floppies, you know, the doctor. Just so many things they love just sweeping under the rug, and it's showing it once again, how they're going to sweep this entire Tsukiyama operation just under the rug. And Kijima realizes they're going to have to have a different group probably investigate on this just to see if CCG is really lying about this and not really giving out information. So I like the way this is going right now. We're getting into some politics and stuff with the regular world. Not just focusing on ghouls, but V in general. So more of V information is getting fleshed out. Okay, so the next part we're getting into is Kuri being ordered to start the Tsukuyama operation. For instance, exterminate the Tsukuyama family and get rid of them. And... Now we're getting into the final movements of this arc, the Tsukiyama family extermination. <sighs> Remember I talked about this. I talked about this a long time ago. I talked about this when this arc first began in the early 30s. The early fucking 30s, I talked about this. That was weeks ago. Months ago, actually. I talked about this of how... The Tsukiyama family is in a major crisis right now. Depending on Shu's actions and his subordinates' actions will cause to where the entire family might be wiped out. And that's what's going on right now. CCG has the evidence that it's a ghoul family. They control so much and they're coming after them. There's nothing they can do. So, in a sense, Shu's decision is being made for him. Finally, the cards he tried to play and what he tried to do for Sasaki... It's leading into a bad situation because his family's about to be wiped out. And most likely his father's going to die as well. Oh yeah, we also have it to where Washu meets up with Kuri. They, they have like a... They stare at each other a little bit and they think inside their head. You have it to where Kuri, he looks at Washu and he's like, What a sly hyena. Hungry, hungering for credit. And then Washu's like, A brat from the Arima devotees. Okay, so these two don't like each other. Well, we're seeing some strife between these and you know how they don't like each other and once again showing complications with CCG and how they operate behind the scenes. So the next part we get into, we get to see the Quinkex children's group with Sasuke and how they're going to be handling this upcoming operation to wipe out the Tsukiyama family. As we know, Sasuke hasn't heard the name of Shu yet. He doesn't know his name, and so, of course, he doesn't know who Sukiyama is. And I'm willing to bet if he saw Shu, he'd probably freak out, and he's like, holy crap, I'm gonna be attacking probably my friends from the past. And this is kind of shown as an example that Kaneki Ken is starting to show more of who Sasuke's personality because of some of the actions that happen later on. But for now, the operation is underway, and we have it to where each group, you know, the Quinkex children getting in their own situations to where... Their battle formation. So, Ure and Mutsuki are going to be the vanguard. They're going to be up front. Saiko is going to be in the middle. And Shirazu is going to be in the back. Now, let's look at what this actually means as a team. Shirazu is going to be the rear guard. For instance, he watches the back, making sure no one does a sneak attack. And he also has a job to make sure that nobody comes from the sides. And he has to be the brains of the operation, making sure he observes everything where nothing wrong happens. And he controls, like, all attacks from long range. Now, Psycho, she is in the center with the winner move attack, according to what it says here, which once again implies that Psycho has a very strong Kakuho inside of her that might be Centipede. For instance, Kaneki Ken's Kakuho inside of her, and so she might have a similar, you know, Kagune like Sasuke or Kaneki. So she has the winning move of the group. Now, Ure and Mutsuki, they're on Vanguard, so they're, they're on the front line, and that's a very dangerous job. That means they're going to be taking the brunt of the entire enemy force, and they're going to have to guard the back part. They're going to have to guard the center and the far, like the back part where Shirazu is. Now, Ure is the support. He supports the center, and Mutsuki combat at the Vanguard. So, Ure has to worry about protecting the center. He has to worry about center. He has to protect Psycho to where she doesn't get hurt and she could be ready for her winner move, Mutsuki has to worry about the front line and probably watching over Ure and Ure watching over her. So I like once again how Ishida is having it to where Ure and Mutsuki team up together 
and that connection between them is growing even more as the chapters go by. I, their, their friendship is growing, and I'm liking it. I'm liking where Ishida's taking Ure and Mutsuki's character. Okay, so we got that out of the way. Let's move on. I like the little conversation that Psycho says to Mutsuki. She says this, I'll protect you, Mutsuko. I love you. Oh, she's so sweet. She's so sweet. Little sweet psycho. Man. <sighs> Fucking best girl. Best girl psycho. Just sitting there like, I'll protect you, Mutsuko. Oh, that's all I can get. That's all I can get. Okay. <sighs> Next part. Shirazu, once again, still having trouble with using his weapon, Nutcracker. And Nutcracker, this, this weapon, this Queen K, is being built up a lot like anyone else notice how this queen K is just being built up and when this is finally used by shirazu it's going to symbolize so much development for shirazu as a character and he right now is sitting in his room just laying back contemplating about what he should do since he's in the back and he might have to use his weapon against upcoming ghouls to protect everybody shirazu asks sasaki about how he can use his Kagane a lot better. Like, he, he's contemplating about Nutcracker. He doesn't really want to use it. And he asks Sasaki, could you teach me how to use my Kagane? So, I'm liking how this is going, the bond between Sasaki and Shirazu, how they continuously show Sasaki acting like a mentor, like a father figure to his little family. And as, you know, last chapter with, you know, Shu and... Sasaki and the family. Oh my god. I'm just like so fucking sad. It's so sad. I, I want to cry, man, when I see some of these panels because it's just like no matter how much I look at it, just some of the meaning behind it just so symbolic. And it just hits you. It really hits you. If you have these attachments to these characters, especially I've grown really attached to Shirazu or the Quinkex Children Squad. I I've just I've grown really attached to this squad. And seeing how Shirazu just comes to Sasuke like that, he's like, hey. Could you, could you teach me how to use my Kagane? He's like opening up to Sasuke. He's like, hey, could you help me? I mean, you're the only one I probably could ask for help right now. I mean, I'm the leader and I have to show this front to where I'm powerful and strong and I gotta make sure I put on a good impression for the people underneath me. That's kind of the status Shirazu is in right now. Like, he's in this situation where since he is the leader, he has to put up this great mask to where he can't show weakness. Like, sometimes he can, but he has to be strong for the people around him. And the only person you could really ask about this is someone like Sasuke. And so it shows you once again how Shirazu puts his faith in Sasuke, how he cares about him, but also how Shirazu views himself as a leader. He cares about his leader status and he's trying hard for the people around him, Ure, Mutsuki, Saiko, even Sasuke. He's trying really hard. And to come to someone like Sasuke and ask him for advice or help, it just shows you once again he's willing to accept help and willing to be a strong leader. So this little characterization and character development for Shirazu, very beautiful. I love that Ishida, keep up the good shit here. Just seeing Shirazu develop is such a good character. Like I wouldn't think he'd be such a good character when I first started the series, like when I started part two. I, I didn't think I would grow this close to these characters, but I really, if I saw one of them die, I'd, I'd probably cry my ass off. I probably would. If I saw one of these characters die, you bet your ass I'm crying because well, just getting to see these personalities grow from the beginning and the connection with Sasuke. Okay, so we have, once again, where Kuri, he's just thinking in his mind, and all of a sudden, Arima pops up. And yeah, we get a surprise appearance of Arima in this chapter. I'm liking how Arima is reappearing constantly for these past couple chapters. And, I mean, he's one of my favorite characters, but to see Papa, just Papa popping up. Ah... I love it. I, I just love him popping up, you know, just being in the chapter. So the conversation here, back, back on topic, Kuri and Arima have their conversation. He's like, don't get too reckless with this operation. He's worrying about his, you know, subordinate. And then Kuri's like, says the one that lets me do that all the time, for instance, be reckless. And as we know, they, they have their past and they're connected. They were in the same squad. And seeing this, it just shows you Artima does care about his subordinates underneath him. He really does. I mean, he shows a smile on his face. Like, you remember in the last chapter, it showed that Artima, he, he was a type of person that didn't really show much emotion. But now he's kind of showing emotions to the people around him. Like, you know, how he smiled to Kuri and Kuri smiles at him. 
gotta love that. That's just that connection between them and showing how Artima does care about Kuri. But there's a thing about this panel that scares the shit out of me. With Artima popping up and saying, don't get too reckless, saying this to Kuri, that's very strong. We've seen him do some crazy shit. For Artima to come up, smile, and say that to someone, I feel like that's a death flag. I feel like Kuri just got set up with a death flag. Like, he, he's gonna die. He's gonna fucking die. <sighs> I hope he doesn't die. I, I, I really hope Kuri doesn't die. Because that, that entire Artima scene right here, with him smiling, talking, don't get too reckless, and then, you know, him saying, like, oh, says the one that always lets me do... Get reckless all the time. Just death flag central right there. Now, Artima gets called out of the room. He walks out and he has to leave. And Kuri's like, yes, goodbye, Artima. And that's probably going to be their final goodbye. I want to say, if the death flag is correct, that's probably their final goodbye. Makes you wonder what Artima really knows. But for now, moving on. We move, we move over to one of the saddest parts of the chapter to me. Like... I'm I'm gonna be real with you. When I when I saw this, I was listening to the Glassy Sky and I was listening to that song while I was reading this chapter. I got to the scene when I see Sasuke, he's looking at books. He's just looking for old books and stuff, and Akira just walks up to him and is like, What are you looking for? What you doing? And he's like, Oh, I'm just looking for some old documents. That's what Sasuke says, you know, Akira. And you have a door Sasuke asks, like, you used to be stationed in the 20th ward, right? And he's like, There's something I would want to ask. And Akira just comes right out and says, is it about Omo? And you see, like, this look of malice kind of in her eye, like she's hiding something. And then Sasuke kind of, you could tell from his face expression in the panel, like, he notices something's off. And he's like, oh, yeah. And then he's like, what's going on? The atmosphere suddenly just changed. So he realizes something's going on, like, something very serious, some deep shit just happened. Because Akira's entire personality just changed with that one word of just mentioning Omo. And we do know Omon and Akira's connection, you know. So seeing this right here, yeah. So, she goes along the lines of saying, he was my co-worker who later died in the owl suppression operation. Other than that, what else do you want to know? And then Sasuke's like, I, about the eye patch ghoul. And then Akira's like, there's no need for you to know. Like, why, why do you need to know? And we do know why Akira's hiding it, trying to not let Sasuke know his past. And he says, like, why don't I need to know? It has something to do with me, doesn't it? I won't repeat myself again. And then this... It's hard for me not to get emotional just seeing this panel, man. It's hard. Why are you hiding it? He just screams out at Ocarina. He's like, why are you hiding this? I mean, let's, let, let's just, you know, let, let me continue. Damn, I'm, I'm getting emotional. Is it because I'm the eye patch ghoul? Is it because I was the one who killed Almo? The fear of waking up and knowing nothing. Do you know what that's like? How I can only cling onto what's given to me. The Quinkex children. Akira. Arima. You know, just certain things that's given to them. How I don't even know my own parents. Where did I even come from? I, I, who am I? Haize, calm down. I am not Haize. Dude, I get so fucking emotional, man, reading this shit. Woo! Oh, oh God, dude, I get so fucking emotional reading this shit, man. You don't want to see how I was when I first read this chapter, man. Just like, seeing my boy Haize... I'm not high. Oh, God, dude. Fuck these emotions, man. Why must I feel? <sighs> okay, so... We get a flashback. And... You have it to where... Akira is stationed to be... Haize's foster mother. That is what was said in the past. When... Kaneki Ken, before he became Haize Sasaki, they were talking about how he's very intelligent, he has great memory capabilities, 
He, he has, you know, a great personality, and he is antisocial, just many things. But he craves a motherly figure, someone like Akira, or a mother. Because we do know about, you know, Kaneki Kin's past. And it's just, it's so weird how this was set up, because, you know, Arima is kind of like the foster father. Akira is the foster mother. And with this, we come to find out that Akira has been stationed as the mentor or the trainer of Heisei Sasaki to be a mother. She was ordered to be a mother. And I don't even know where to begin. I don't even know where to begin with my emotions right now for this scene. You want to know why? Is this implying that Akira is forcefully just fake loving Heisei? Is that what this is implying? See, you don't really know. Like, you, I have conflicted feelings. Like, you see a pained expression on Akira, and you don't know if that is true emotions. Like, she cares for Haize as a mother, or if that's fake, and she was just being ordered to do that. Because she was ordered. It just, the, the chapter straight up just says that Akira was ordered to be a motherly figure to Haize. Fine. Maybe at first, she had this, you know, ordered where she didn't really care about Haize, and she was just acting like a motherly figure. But maybe now she does think about something like that. Maybe she does feel like a mother kind of to Heisei Sasaki. Whatever the case may be, I I'm just going to say right now. If Akira is faking, like, I, I don't believe she is. But if she is, if there is an off chance Akira is faking, that she is the motherly figure to Sasaki. And she's faking this bullshit. Like, if she is faking that shit, I'm telling you right now, my rage for her right now. My, my rage for Akira, if that is fake love. That is fake love. I am going to be so fucking pissed. Like, like my, my respect for Akira's character would just dive into the fucking dirt. Like, no, it would go six feet under. If, like, Akira would be dead to me if, if she is faking this. Like, I'm sorry. I'm not saying she is dead to me right now. I'm just saying if she is faking this love right now for all these years, and she still is and feels nothing for Sasuke at this moment, she's dead to me as a character. But, I'm not going to say that, because I believe because of this panel work, she probably does care about Haize. So for now, I'm just going to say, if she does care about him, this is definitely going to add some complications in the future for Akira. Because the way the story is going, the way it's progressing, I've said this, Sasuke's going to end up dying. He, he's going to die, and Kaneki is going to return. But it's not going to be the Kaneki we know of from part one. I've said this. It's not going to be the same Kaneki. It's going to be a mix of Sasuke and Kaneki, but an entirely new personality that's arrived from these two kind of merging together. And it's just going to be something that we probably didn't expect. So never think that Haize or the original Kaneki is going to return. Kaneki is not going to return. Maybe in a sense he will, but he's not going to be completely back. And so, this is going to cause complications. Like, when Sasuke goes rogue and probably leaves CCG because of certain things and issues that happen, he's probably going to have it to where Akira is going to be, you know, kind of chasing him down. She's probably going to be tasked with exterminating him, maybe Arima and her. And she's probably not going to do that because it's going to be like her taking and killing her own child. That'd be fucked up, dude. That'd be very fucked up. So yeah, that, that's where that's going right now. Like, if you don't understand this, if Sasuke rebels against CCG and he leaves, he's going to be stationed as a rebel ghoul. Like, kill the fucking ghoul. And that would mean that Akira and Arima most likely are going to be hunting him down to kill him. And that's like they're killing their own damn son. <sighs> Sheeta, why you do this shit, man? Don't do this shit to me, man. I don't like this shit, dude. I don't fucking like this shit, dude. You're making me feel... Okay, okay, let, let's just move on. Let's just fucking move on, okay? I'm tired of feeling right now with this chapter. I'm not even done with this. Just fucking. That fucking. Uh. Okay, 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 okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just hard. Hard to hold that shit back. Okay, so we move over to Shu and his father. And I, I gotta take note of Shu's father. He just walks in for the door holding a cup of coffee with a plate. He's like, Shu. He, he just acts like a fucking pimp. He's just leaning up against the door. He's like, yeah, I'm a fucking pimp. That is badass, okay? I, I gotta give props to Shu's father. He just, he looks like a mouse. But of course, he does control a lot of things in the regular world, so. Yeah, I guess he would be kind of a, a figure that's, like, swagging. Now, you have it to where Shu's father comes up and starts talking to him. 
He's like, you're thinking over something hard, aren't you? And he's like, I made you some coffee, Shu. She was like, thank you. And Shu has like a shock. He's like, expect no less of your coffee. I'm not tired at all anymore. And then he passes out. So, as I said earlier, Shu, he didn't play his cards right. His subordinates and him didn't play his cards right. It costed the entire Sukiyama family to be outed out as ghouls. CCG is on the move. They're coming for Shu's family. Because of the danger, Shu's father knocks him unconscious to get him away. Matsume is tasked with taking Shu away. And Shu's father is probably going to stay there to die and stall time. You know, let me talk about the meaning behind this, okay? I, I, we know for a fact the way this is going with the death lags here. Shu's father knocking Shu out and telling Matsume just to take Shu and go. He's planning on staying there long enough just to stall time before they can escape. Like, that is the entire thing right here. Shu's father is just staying there to stall time until they escape. And then he's probably gonna die. Since we know the Tsukiyama group is tied to high up their status in politics because most likely they paid off CCG or V, or maybe the Tsukiyama group is connected with V in some way, Maybe since the failure of actions and, you know, their secret got out, V's probably punishing Tsukiyama's father. And it's like, if you want to save your family, you're going to have to die. That, that's probably where this is going. Maybe Shu's father made a deal with V and's like, okay, I'll kill myself if you let my son go. Like, I'll, I'll let you guys kill me, take everything, but please let my son go. I'm willing to bet something like that's going on. So probably... The deal here is Shu's father has to die for V to stay off the back of Shu. Now let's think about this in another standpoint. What is Shu going to do when he wakes up and realizes what's going on? Like, when he wakes up, what is Shu's reaction going to be? Let's think. Just recently in the last chapter, Shu had contact with Sasuke Haize. Sasuke Haize is not the Kaneki that Shu knows of. He knows for fact now. And he knows that Sasuke is part of CCG. He is a dove. And so Dove's you know, main goal is to exterminate ghouls. And since you had it to where Sasuke just flat out said, like, are you a ghoul to Tsukiyama Shu, Shu's probably going to start questioning in his mind, like, wait a minute. Did Sasuke just out my entire family? And kill my entire family? That's what Shu might think. He might think that Sasuke turned over his family to CCG to get killed. Because, think about it. Like, his first reactions are probably going to think that. He's going to wake up, he's going to realize he's not in the same location anymore. His family's probably fucking dead. His father's dead. Everybody's dead. And he's by himself. And he's going to think like, Sasuke just outed me out. My entire family is dead, thinks it. That's what he's going to think. Even though we know Sasuke didn't do that. That's what he's probably going to think, and that's probably where it's leading. And if that does, oh my god, just, I'm not even going to, oh my god. Oh my god, like, yeah. Okay, so, the operation to exterminate Shu's family is underway. The doves are at their fucking doorstep. Kuri has a black case. I Actually, I want to I take a few moments to talk about that. If you look at all the briefcases of CCG, like, they have, like, this whitish color. But if you look at Kuri in the front, his briefcase is solid black. So, that's probably emphasizing that it's Arita. That's like Arita Kakuja type armor. Probably what that's implying. So, this is going to be a very brutal fight. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so this next part... <sighs> this chapter should just be called Titled Fills. Like, that, that's what this chapter should. The best way to emphasize, and just do a quick summary on this page I'm looking at right here... Is Kanye, he's broken. He's done. He's replanted. Eto has broken this man beyond repair. There's a lot of symbolism in this page. A lot of meaning. A lot of things you could pull out with this one page. And a lot of questions as well. 
And with many questions, we have more questions. I know there is some out there right now that read Tokyo Ghoul. I've seen it in the comments. That some don't like Kanye. Like, I, I know for a fact there are some Chibits out there that just do not like Kanye as a character. And sometimes he can be a little bit of a prick. But I've enjoyed his character quite a bit, actually. I, I've enjoyed his progression and his connection with Shu. And I love seeing him go through his different issues and what he's been through. Even though he's caused a lot of shit and what he did to Psycho, I, I can't stand what he did to Psycho. Getting her hurt. At the end of the day, Psycho is fine right now. I don't believe Kanye deserved what he is currently going through in this chapter. This poor man. I don't even want to begin to know how painful this torture is. It's probably worse than what happened to Kaneki, in a way. This poor guy. He's just, he's not even, if you look at this page, he's not even tied up. Like, he, he he's not tied up now. Like... He, he, he's lifeless. His arms are on the fucking ground. He, his, his knuckles are just on the ground. His head is down. You just see blood pouring out of his mouth. You see these wounds all over his body. His cognate's coming out. I'll get into the cognate in a moment. You see these fucking clocks all around him. And you just see Eto with a bunch of pile of books. Bandages all around her. Just sitting there talking to him. And just doing symbolism to the Bible. Just what this, just the position Kanye is in right now just symbolizes how broken he is. He is on his knees, bowing. He is bowing in a sense. Like, if you look at this, like, he's bowing. His knuckles are on the damn ground. His knees are on the ground. And it looks like he's just bowing before Eto. <sighs> he does not deserve this. No matter how much you might hate Kanye as a character... That's something you wouldn't wish on someone. That that's horrible. That's horrible. That that that's really horrible. Okay. I want to quote this. I want to quote what Eto is saying before I dive into the meaning of this page. Kanye, if you want to be treasured by people, just take away what matters most to that person. Okay, let's say you treasured a nickel. And you care about this nickel because it has sentimental value to you. I mean, your parents gave it to you. Or maybe someone you love died and they gave it to you before they died. Maybe you have connection with this said item, okay? What Eto is implying here is, like, if you want to be treasured by people, like, if this person treasures you, or if you want this person to treasure you, get rid of what they treasure most. Like, let's say you like this nickel, and this person behind you loves you, and wants they want you to treasure them, but you love this nickel over them, which that's kind of fucked up if you do, but still, the point is, if you love, like, this said item over someone else, and they want you to treasure them... The best way is just to remove that treasure, throw it away, burn that treasure, break that treasure, destroy the family of that treasure. And then you will be the only treasure left, because they have nothing left to treasure. You get the point. Break everything until they have nothing left to treasure. And then you're the only thing they can treasure. That dialogue, Eto, is fucked up. That's fucked up. Like, if they love a nickel, throw away the nickel. They love that person, kill that person. Oh, they, they like this sad thing over you? Remove that thing from their life. And then, you're the only one they could possibly care about. So, Echo is once again proving... <sighs> I, got, I, I, I just don't know how to... It's fucking name it so mind-fucked right now. Okay, so... Besides the, to remove the most treasured thing, Eto sa uh, says this. This is biblical symbolism. I'll share a bone with you. Don't worry. You'll be loved this time. You'll see. Just look at yourself. What this symbolism means... Is... From the book of Genesis. Eto has been using Bible references recently... And you remember when Adam and Eve was born, God took a rib from Adam to make Eve? You remember that? You remember how Adam had a rib removed to make Eve? It's in the book of Genesis. In a sense, Eto is symbolizing herself as God and Adam. She is being God and Adam at the same time. She's giving up, like, let's say a bone, a rib, to Kanye, for instance, a cognate. 
and she's being God, making a new person. She is making a new person, which symbolizes the chapter title, Replant. The chapter's name is Replant. She's replanting Kanye as a person. Giving him a bone. Making him a new person. Making a new person. Bone made Eve. You get my point. So, Etta right now is making a person. She's playing God. She's making a new personality. A new guy. And what did she give Kanye? Not just torture. No. She didn't give him just torture. Why don't we take a quick look at that Kagane spouting from Kanye's back. Let's look at that Kagane real quick. If you look closely, really closely... What do you see on that Kagane? Like, what do you see? You see mouse. Yeah, you, you see mouse. And what was the focus of last chapter? A talking fucking Kagane. A talking Kagane. Like, sentient Kagane. So. What this shows is that maybe Eto implanted her detachable Kagane, Noro, or some form of Noro, inside of Kanye. And currently, that Noro or maybe that detachable Kanye is inside of Kanye and eating his insides or just fucking with him in the inside, just messing with him. And she's probably reconstructing him in a sense, like reconstructing his Kakuho and his Kagane, and that's what we're seeing popping out of his back. So, Eto gave Kanye a, a part of her Kakuho or Kagane. And that is the replanting process. She's replanting his cognate. Or as a person. Many meanings behind this. And one thing I want to talk about is the clocks. Now, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you guys. There, I don't know the concrete evidence of what these clocks really mean. I know there's many ways you could take these clocks. So, if you have your own theory about this I don't mention, please mention in the comments. But I have a couple I want to throw out there. But I don't know which one is correct. So if you have your own fury to add on to this, or if you want to add on to what I've already said, please do it in the comments. I'll be thankful to actually see what you guys think about it. So the clocks surrounded by Kanye, they have to mean something. There's a shit ton of clocks. There's like 20 to 30 clocks all around, like stacked upon each other. And knowing Ishida, this wouldn't be there just to not be there. They're obviously important. And because recently we found out more about Eto, her Kagane, and how it could talk, and then, you know, Noro most likely being a detachable Kagane, and he carried around a clock in part one, it might imply that these clocks could mean that Noro is inside of Kanye. That this way could mean. Or a timer of how long Noro can be inside of Kanye. Or the clocks can represent the torture method. For instance, like, look at all these clocks, Kanye. Like, Eto's telling Kanye to look at the clocks. Like, see all these clocks? See how the time ticks? Yeah, I want you to know how long time has passed while I sit here and torture you. While reading German poems, by the way. Or singing germ German. That's, uh, kind of fucked up. But, point is, is that these clocks could represent something similar to what Jason did to Kaneki. Like, you know... 1,000 minus 7, it could be something similar to that, where, like, I want you to look at the clock for you can know how much time has passed, for you can continue to keep track of what is going on, because, think about it, when you look at a clock, let's say you're in school or something, and let's say the clock said 1.05 p.m., okay, you look at the clock, and you're in school, and you keep staring at this clock, and then you think time, a lot of time has passed, but you look at the clock again, and it's like 1.08 p.m., you think, like, fuck, time is going slow, and that's kind of what this might mean, like, how time is going so slow for Kanye at the moment, like, it just, it's going so slow while he's being tormented, agonizing for hours to weeks. Get my point. So, yeah. The clocks could represent the torture method of him just, you know, losing track of time or time being very slow. And then, it can be another meaning. It could mean that maybe Eto, now this is a fear. Maybe Eto is taunting Kanye in a way where like, hey, your master, Shu, he's not coming to save you, is he? He's not saving you, is he, Kanye? No, he's not coming, is he? He's not here. Look at the time. Look at all the time that's passed. He's not coming, is he? Maybe the clocks represent how much time has passed. And how many days have passed or whatever. And maybe just... Shu not appearing to save Kanye in this endless torture cycle. Maybe Eto might have given Shu's father information. Like, what if Eto gave some form of information to Shu's father? Told him, like, okay, here's where I am. If you want your boy Kanye back, come bring Shu over here and, you know, save Kanye. If you want. You gotta offer me Shu. 
for the replacement of Kanye. Like, if you want to save Kanye, gotta give me Shu. It's like equal exchange. Maybe that's what Eto said to Shu's father. And we do know that Shu's father cares about him quite a bit, because... He knocked him out and told him to be carried off somewhere else, where we don't know, which I'm going to assume that's probably somewhere close to the Sixth War where Bonjo might be at, or Rize, because, you know, Ishida recently did an illustration on Twitter with Rize, so maybe she was going to see Rize. But for now, though, yeah, but to where maybe Eto told Shu's father about where she is and wanted, you know, Shu's father to give up Shu for the replacement of Connie. And maybe Shu's father hasn't said enough in the shoe because of all the shit that's been going down, but also he cares about his son. And so he just threw Connie to the table and was like, I don't give a shit about you. I'm worried more about my family, my own blood. And that's where it's going right now. And so Eto's taunting him with the time, like, oh, see how much time has passed? Oh, he's not coming, is he? He's not coming. He's not coming. That that would be messed up, too, if it went that way. I and mean, then another... Now, this one is far-fetched, okay? I, I'm admitting right now what I'm about to say here is very far-fetched, okay? It's a grain of salt grain of fucking salt what I'm about to say here. This one is a grain of salt. Now, I don't even believe it's correct. I'm just throwing it out there because I want to throw all these theories on the table because it's best I have everything on the table to just leave some things out. So another theory that is the most least likely to have, like least likely, I highly doubt, but I'm going to do it because I don't know exactly what these clocks mean besides what I've already mentioned. Maybe the clocks are symbolizing or telling us how many detachable Kaganes Eto has. Like, what if these clocks are individual different Noros? Well, that's what I'm going to call the detachable Kaganes from Eto. What if these different clocks are individual Noros away from Eto at this moment and their timer ticking down until they can return? What if that's... Or what if that's how many different Noros are inside of Kanye right now? Like, what if all these clocks represent how many are inside of Kanye or how many are away from Eto right now? That, that could also be what the clocks mean, and how much time they have left to be inside of Connie while they're replanting him. Because you see multiple mouths on his cognate, so it could be possible that that's also what the clocks can mean. Who knows? But that would mean that Eto has a lot, a lot, she can, and that means she can control people. Like, she can control them through the cognate. It's scary. That's pretty damn scary. And I think the final page just wraps up my final thoughts of the chapter. Sadness and fucked up mentality of Eto. You remember the video I made a while back about Eto destroying families and most likely doing it because of her book. She wants material for a book. <sighs> the books Eto has on her side, I'm willing to bet it's probably German poems, songs, maybe torture methods of how she could torture Kanye, whatever it may be. We've always seen it to where Eto was always in the shadows through part one and a lot of part two. She was always in the shadows and it's implied that she destroyed a lot of families. There's evidence, kind of. And now seeing this chapter, we have this personality that's always hidden in the shadows of Eto. We finally have this personality for us all to see. Like, we see the true persona of Eto. How she really is behind the scenes. It's not just theories anymore. It's just not just us fury crafting about what Eto might be. We now know what Eto really is. She is a person that takes delight in replanting people. She takes delight, maybe, in destroying families. All that evidence of destroying families connecting with Kaneki, Hinami, all these different things. It kind of is now for us all to see on the surface. We all see what is going on. Kanye having his eyes stitched together, his mouth stitched, can't even scream. The poor man can't even scream. He's just up chucking blood, man. He has blood just pouring out of his mouth. He can't even scream. He can probably barely see. His eyes are like stitched together. And he's opening his eyes up, his eyelids. You know, like he's trying. And you just see tears. You see tears of blood just pouring off. Sheeta, man, you're fucked up sometimes, man. You're fucked up, Sheeta. Like, I, I, I knew you were fucked up somewhat, but damn, you have to be a fucked up individual. It's <laughs> just like, fuck, dude. Like, I, I know Kentaro from Berserk, who writes Berserk, it's kind of fucked up to do what he does, but damn it, dude. Like, Sheeta, you just like, you're kind of twisted yourself. Not just Eto, but just Sheeta. You're kind of just like, fuck. Okay, so I'm done. 
That's it. That's my final thoughts of the chapter. My best way to say is, once again, Tokyo Ghoul proving it's a good series. With controversial themes, to symbolism, biblical themes, references to Japanese folklore, imaginary diseases, beautiful character development, rage and emotions, different a mix of emotions. I, I couldn't hold back my emotions, that's just how good this chapter was. To some very good artwork that demonstrates the beauty of this manga. And the way Ishida is able to incorporate all these different things into a chapter. With the symbolism to this hidden meaning that you really wouldn't get on your first read. is something that only a master writer could possibly do. So once again, Ishida, another job well done on an excellent chapter. That I can't even begin to describe how amazing it is. So tell me your thoughts. How do you feel about this chapter, Tokyo Ghoul? Did you enjoy it? Did you hate it? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Please be safe. And, and oh yeah, actually there's one thing I want to mention before I end this. One thing actually, before I end it. There is a couple of videos I want to make. The couple of videos I want to make is... um, I, I saw recently there was a diaries from volume 4 of Tokyo Ghoul Read that was like let out for the public to see. There was diaries to Hinami's diary, and then Torso had a diary, Shu had a diary if I'm correct. There was a bunch of diaries that were translated recently, and I'm probably going to be making a separate video for that later on, actually. I will be making a separate video for the diaries that were revealed in the latest volume of Tokyo Ghoul, along with talking about the Route A drafts that were revealed recently, about how the studio that made Tokyo Ghoul just threw away the draft that Ishida made just to write their own anime original bullshit garbage. So yeah. I, I want to make separate videos for that very soon. But for now, let's just talk about this chapter and let's contemplate on this chapter. I'll probably make the video sometime Monday, Tuesday, maybe Wednesday. I'll be making it sometime this week though. But for now, yeah. So you all have a wonderful day or not wherever you live. Please be safe. Chibi